morning, this is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, and hello, kids, and welcome to Season 4 and Episode number 370 of the Daily Diva Morning Show here on the Crying DVM Network. Yeah! Today, recording day is Monday, April, oops, sorry, 29th. 2024, and it looks like it's a bit of a great day here at the Ottawa Beaver Lodge. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver pronoun, he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A, and with me, as always, as you can see, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Mystery Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. We have our usual Monday morning show for you, but before we do anything else, we'll say good morning to Mr. Grizzly. And ask, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Well, Mr. Beaver, um, <clears throat> I am so tired, I, I don't even know. <laughs> mm. I went to bed at 9 o'clock last night. I was fall- like sitting on the couch, falling asleep, and I just looked at Bridget. I go, I, I got to go to bed. I can't, I can't stay up. Climbed into bed, fell asleep. 11.30, woke up um, with just horrible heartburn. And then it was Ooh. like every every hour, every two hours after that, same thing. Like just brutal heartburn. I had no no medication to take care of it. It was all out. And you know, you walk by it in the store and you think, Oh, I don't need that and don't buy it and then you need it. Yeah, that was my case. So yep. yeah. So I'm I'm uh heartburn's gone now, thankfully, but I'm I'm really tired. <laughs> oh. Uh I'm not I'm thankfully, not a little tired. Thankfully I'm working from home today though, so you know, yeah, I'm a little tired too. Cause, uh... Oh, you froze. Did we lose Mr. Beaver? I think we lost him. Looks like we've, looks like, yeah, yeah, he's frozen. Oh, there you're back. I think oh, there we, we were go. frozen yeah. for a second. Weird Can't screen. hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know. I saw that. Was Very weird. strange. Yeah. Uh, uh, a bit tired as well, because uh, uh, I have been sleeping on the sofa because we have family here. House guests. Oh, oh, we lost him all together. I guess he'll come back in a moment or two. And there he is. He's coming back. There we are. It was weird. <laughs> he what just dropped right off the face of the earth there. And showing you have a good signal, so I don't know what the cause is. Uh, it's strange. But you're all blurry now. Yeah. So. <laughs> There you go. Linda's oh, giving you a now too. Yeah. frozen beaver. <laughs> frozen beaver. Yep. Frigid meat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, funny. so the big thing uh, going on here at home is that uh, the Ontario 15 and under boys provincial volleyball championships are going on. And my nephew is playing in it. Go Venom Vipers. Uh, yesterday they had their first three rounds uh, and uh, in pool play, 
and uh, won all three matches in straight sets. So a three and zero record and a six and zero for sets. Um, they've been playing really, really well. Uh, they continue to win pool play again today. Uh, I think they, 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 there's some crossover in the pools. So they'll be playing uh, different opponents. Uh, and then I guess they get to the, I guess the playoff rounds will probably be on the, the following day. Jeez. Uh, what's the problem? Oh, he's frozen again. Having, having technical glitches this morning, yeah. it would seem. Are you still there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to connect to another uh, internet yeah, service because nope. this one is probably not working. Yeah, it's, it, it certainly seems right. like it. Yeah, there's uh, definitely an issue there. The, I'll keep everybody entertained. Jump in and jump out. Yeah. Okay, no problem. We'll see you shortly. So Mr. Beaver's going to try and get things fixed up on his end. Oh, and my phone decided that it wanted to go into uh, dictation mode, and I just looked down, and it was starting to say everything I was saying. <laughs> How's that? There, that's better. You're you're not blurry. Can you right. hear us now? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, there we go. That's better. All right. Well, clearly the hotspot provided by the building does not work. Uh, so we've seen. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's well, great because um, I'm literally outside what's supposed to be the meeting room here. Okay. So if there's no hot hot service in the meeting room, I don't know what's going on. Uh, as you uh, may notice, kids, I'm not uh, in my. Uh, regular place when I'm at the Ottawa Beaver Lodge. I'm actually downstairs in uh, uh, right beside the, uh, the meeting room in the, the pool room, <laughs> billiards room here uh, at uh, the Ottawa Beaver Lodge. Uh, so uh, you might hear a little echo today. Uh, it's a you know, big room with not a lot of stuff in it. So yeah. <laughs> it, do you um, have your earbud headphones? Yes, I do. They have them. Oh, they are, you are using them. Okay. Okay. Yes. I wasn't sure if you were using them. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I'm okay. surprised because no, normally they cut the echo out, but meh, whatever. Well, Maybe check. I, there's, there's a setting Select there. there. Yeah, go into audio and yeah. check the uh, settings there. Maybe that'll do it. Because you can hear me, yeah. but I think it's picking up a different mic. How about that? That might be the case. Is uh, this better? You're, you're, maybe a little bit. It's hard to tell. Yeah, the audio input says group, put, group two headset. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. And output uh, output should say the same as well. Let's do less of this Can't stuff and actual more stuff. There we go. Is it We're good. Out? That's fine. We'll roll with this. Yeah, that's fine. We'll yeah. roll with this. Let's go. All right. So, uh, yes, I am uh, downstairs because uh, the beaver sweetie and the father-in-law uh, are still sleeping. <laughs> Weren't they supposed to get up early yeah. and go for a walk? That was the plan originally, yes. <laughs> walk in the morning coffee. Uh, but that Best did not laid plans of mice and men. <laughs> <laughs> and now, on my phone, I do not know where uh, you went. I'm still here. I can see you, but I you're frozen. I can't see you at all. Well, you're frozen with a smiling face, so it's all good, and I can hear you. So. Uh, you got a smiley face. That's all that matters. We'll just keep going. Okay. We'll just keep going. This is clearly not working today. No, it's working right. again. Yeah, yeah, but this is not going smoothly today because we spent all this time talking about tech stuff and nothing yeah. yet. Just, just, <laughs> um, don't worry about it. Anyway, don't worry about it. Extremely interesting for the viewers. Um, anyway, so yes, uh, they are here. Uh, so uh, we're going to do the best that we can today and uh, tomorrow, and then we'll be back to our uh, regular set up on Wednesday. So uh, we thank you for your patience. Um, News-wise, it's been an extremely slow news weekend, oddly enough. Uh, so uh, there's really not that much new to report in terms of developments uh, or things that were really uh, interesting in terms of what's going on with government. Uh, today, budget-wise, uh, votes are going to start on certain aspects of it, uh, we're going to start with uh, amendments uh, presented by the Conservatives. Uh, the amendments of the Conservatives basically scraps the budget and impose our budget instead. Let us govern from the opposition benches. 
um, which of course no government allows an opposition ever to do, so that will be soundly rejected. But before they can vote on that, they'll have to vote on a Bloc Québécois amendment to the Conservative amendment that has some things that the Conservatives would never vote for. And uh, the Bloc Québécois amendment to the Conservative amendment complains once again about the federal government interfering in the jurisdiction of Quebec, so there's nobody can support this. Um, that, I'm not sure if that's the aspect with which the Conservatives uh, federally would disagree because you know, Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, seem to have the same position as Quebec on this in uh, theory, yet uh, in practice, uh, they don't do the things that Quebec has done. As we uh, mentioned on the, the previous show, they did not show up to the table with money, matching money for housing. Uh, they did not start a national daycare program over 20 years ago, and they did not have a uh, carbon equivalents that would meet the requirements of the federal backstop, backstop and had it for several years, well over a decade, as has Quebec. Mm. So, right, they want to be treated like Quebec, but they just don't want to do the work. Well, right. works hard. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, so of course works hard. I mean, so, you know, so is actually coming up with real policy and actual yeah. counter arguments to federal programs that are actually somewhat better to reality. Um, it's way more easy just to pull something way out of your ass rather than actually doing the research and coming up with something that is actually logical, yeah. rational, feasible, practical. <laughs> Much easier to just pull something out of your ass and say that the federal government is paying people to set the forest fires so that they can teach them the lesson rather than actually oh, wow. having to. For example, negotiate with the indigenous people to start a controlled burden program in the province. For example, um, that's way more work. So, yeah, we're going to have this thing in the House of Commons. But what happens is that uh, these motions now and all these votes are going to be confidence motions by necessity because they're money guys. It's a budget. And still, the NDP hasn't officially said whether or not it will support the government. It's still trying to do. That's an, I get it in DP, you got to pretend that there's some type of suspense so that the media keeps on coming to you every day and putting a mic in your face, and hopefully you'll get a couple of column inches. Because there's nothing much, there's not much else we're doing that's good news and rest here. The plain coin, will we, won't we? It's like, we know he will. We know he will. He has a reach suspension. He will. This is not a mystery. And no. also, is kind of indicating that if they were to go now, but yeah, the liberals might lose, and maybe that's enough to make the NDP happy. But uh, they're not coming out with 26 seats or 24 seats or anywhere what they got now either. So, you know, if, if you want to go now so that the liberals don't get to be in the government and you want to come out of the election with 12 seats and lose your job, go for it, Juggy. Let's get, let's get Juggy with it. So, <laughs> so there's the media is trying to create this restless horse race, or will they won't be, or suspense, or drama. There, there's no drama. If Mr. Singh does vote against it, it'll be, uh, as uh, Mr. Grizzly says, that's a bold move, Cotton. Let's see uh, how it works out for you. Yeah, it's because he's. Be oh. He lost Mr. Beaver again. He would be voting against his own best interests if he did that. So I, I don't understand what's going on. It's just bizarre, his behavior. Uh, well, we'll wait till see if uh, Mr. Beaver comes back. Uh, his, his connection dropped altogether. I'm going to cover a story that was, uh, you may or may not be aware of. A few people pointed it out to me and I checked into it. Uh, this is from Press Progress. There was a story about an Ottawa book festival. Um, took place at the Horticultural Center at uh, Lansdowne Park, TD Place Stadium. And let's see if Mr. Beaver's back. Are you there? Can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah. So I was just telling about the, uh, the press progress story about the Ottawa Book Festival that was supposed to take place this past weekend. And did, did, did you hear about this? I think I didn't I highlight it for you. I can't remember if I did or not, but. Um, no this rather duplicitous group of individuals highlighting themselves as a, uh, a book and food festival. And uh, one of the sponsors was the Mexican embassy along with Ottawa tourism. And they all pulled out when they discovered that um, 
So it's so I'll read it to you. At first glance, the Ottawa International Food and let me move this so it's better and easier for me to read. First glance, the Ottawa International Food and Book Expo might sound like any other ordinary event on the social calendars of local foodies and bookworms. But not only will this year's event platform several far right speakers linked to the 2022 Freedom Convoy occupation, a number of the festival's corporate sponsors and key employees also appear to be misleading or fake. This year's event, held at the historic horticultural building at Lansdowne Park, is being promoted by Ottawa Tourism as a celebration of literary culture, crafts, and food. The festival is emceed by former Much Music VJ, VJ Bill Wilichka, features okay, seminars yeah. on creative writing and self-publishing, and has panels on big philosophical questions. It's even hosting a cougar dating event for singles looking to partner with a cub. <sighs> While that may sound like your kind of weekend, a closer look does raise a few red flags. One panel features former PC MPP and anti-lockdown activist Randy Hillier, convoy leader Tom Quiggin and True North's Andrew Lawton. Another panel features uh, PPC leader Maxim Bernier. The Ottawa Book Expo's social media ads also feature scantily clad models and suggestive poses, something that may seem slightly off-topic for a literary festival. In a statement to Press Progress late Friday night, the Embassy of Mexico, which had been scheduled to host a celebration of Mexican-Canadian literature, said it had cancelled its participation in the event, noting concerns over other participants. The Embassy's sole role is to support Mexican writers in the promotion of their books and public events in Canada, an Embassy spokesman told Press Progress. The Embassy does not endorse the view of any participant or sponsor. And there was a community, um, a com community Solidarity Ottawa, which is at Community Solid 2 on the Twitter, um, issued a, uh, an alert for Lansdowne and the surrounding area. And one of the things that was on this page, um, WCNY, a PBS affiliate based in Syracuse, New York, as an official sponsor, they have sponsored in the past. They were not sponsoring this. So this is, this is a greasy, greasy event. They, they, they put up all this promotional material from Sponsors that were not involved with the program whatsoever, sponsors that were there pulled out, and they were featuring a free speech, ethics, and democracy in Canada with Andrew Lawton, Dr. Julie Fontaine, Tom Quiggin, and Randy Hillier. The whole thing just stinks to high heaven. I put a link in the chat if anybody wants to check it out. It's, uh, it was a greasy, it was from Luke Lebrun at Press Progress who, who posted this. And, um, one of the other things we discovered that, um, it, this same group, the guy who was putting this on also, uh, is putting on, he wants to, um, lead a consortium pushing for a CFL expansion team called the Atlantic Moose in Charlottetown, PEI. He wants to build a 25,000 seat stadium. That includes housing, retail event space, and an internet cafe. I'm like, okay, I'm I'm all for CFL expansion, but not if you're not if you're platforming really horrible people who are trying to do harm to others. So that's yeah, it's all bizarre. It looks like you're frozen again, Mister Beaver. I don't know if you can hear me. I'll just pull him out. I think he's. Uh, I think he's having major connection issues this morning, which, you know, sometimes that does happen. Let me give you a second here. Ah, uh, there we go. Uh, okay. Looking out here, we got a photo of, oh, the dog asleep at my feet. Yes. Let's see if we can bring up the Lola cam here. I'll try and add her in. And, uh, uh, Got my extra camera here. Uh, where's the Lola cam? There it is. And yeah, there we go. That's just, I'll add that in. There's the Lola cam. We'll bring her up now. There's the Lola cam. Look at her asleep at my feet. How cute is that? Okay, you're back, sir. Yeah, are you sure it's at my end and not yours? It's not, no, no issues here. I can't, okay. I can't see any problems on this end. This should not be. And I'm looking, happening. I'm only using 34, 30% of my CPU. So, um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Really weird. Um, yeah, that thing that you talked about, uh, I did hear about it actually, but uh, all from the perspective of Bill Walechka, who had, uh, was there the first day and said, uh, what the hell is this? And then that yeah. signaled that he would not be back. Oh, he bailed, did he? Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
once he realized what this was, it's like, uh, dude, do you not realize I have a brand? Yeah. And I don't want like, it associated. What, what, what made you think that a person like me would want to be associated with anything like this? No kidding, right? <laughs> like, I've met Bill a like, couple of times. He's a nice guy. Yeah. He, he, he's, he's literally, he, he was literally he's a, hey, this is my stop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's a, he's a center left uh, progressive, right? And I don't even know what his political bent is party wise, but policy wise, he's definitely a center left individual. I mean, it's, it's rare to find somebody who works in, in that field who is anything but, you know? Yeah. And yeah. it's not because, uh, as Daniel Smith would want to suggest that journalism schools keep people who are conservative minded out. That has nothing to do with that. It has yeah. to do with the fact that being a journalist or a reporter is a human job. You yes. actually go out and meet different people from all different walks of life throughout your entire career. So naturally, you become a person who becomes open to hearing different people's stories and different people's perspectives and wanting to consider, literally wanting to consider all sides and thinking about, okay, well, this is for everybody, but I've talked to many people like this. What about them? It doesn't make them a bleeding heart liberal. It just makes them realize that there's a bigger world out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that people are fascinated. But that's all it is. Journalists deal with people and with telling people stories. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they're not, it's not that they're radicals, but it's like the right would like you to believe that. They're just telling the truth. Well, most of the time, anyway. Most of the time, yeah. there are so, there are individuals that call themselves journalists, like Kian Bext and Andrew Lawton, and you know, they're not journalists any more than you or I are. We're not. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. We, neither one of us went to journalism school. You you you're a professional writer, but you're you're not a journalist. No, no, no not at all. Not by any stretch of the imagination. We just I, want to get the truth out to people, so yeah. we don't. I don't have an editorial bent on any of this. I just want people to know the truth. That's it. That is it. And really when, you, when you're well-informed, you can make a well-informed decision. And most people want to do the right thing for their family, their community, themselves. And if you have the right information at your disposable, disposable, disposal, you can make an informed decision. And then, you know, cast your ballot for the best candidate in, in your writing. That's, I, you know, I spoke to somebody the other day says, well, I'm voting conservative in the next election. I said, okay. He's, aren't you mad about that? And I go, no, you vote for whoever you want. But tell me something though. Why are you voting conservative? Well, I'm sick of Trudeau. That's not a good reason to vote for the other party. What is the party that you're about to vote for yeah, in the next that, election? That's a good reason to not vote at all. Before yeah. Your ballot. But it's not a good or a good reason to actually then like, jump ship and vote for another party. That's a whole other kettle of fish. Like, like why? Uh, why? Okay, you don't like Trudeau. Okay, why don't you like Trudeau? Well, he's been there too long. Okay, but tell me the things that he's done that have actually harmed you. Well, a capital gains tax. I go, that's not harming you. Well, if we sell this house, uh, we're going to have to pay 66%. I go, nope. If you sell the house for over 1.25 million, you will pay an additional tax. If you sell it for under 1.25 million, you won't pay it. What? Huh? That's that's the it's the the way the tax works. It's over the capital gains is on one point two five million. One and a quarter is when it gets hit. No. Well then I've 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 misunderstood. No, 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 no. There's no capital gains on the sale of your primary residence at all. No, no, at okay. All. So there's nothing on primary if, residence. If you inherit a residence Yes, that's capital what they're, gains, that's, yeah. capital gains are paid by the estate at the yes. time of disposition. When it comes to you, you would only pay capital gains because if you sold it and you would only right. pay capital gains on the, on the change of the value of the house from the day you got it, not the right. day that your parents bought it because they've already paid the capital gains on that, the estate at disposition there. And then, then you would be taxed at the individual, so your first two hundred and fifty thousand in capital right. gains after you inherit, not pre-inherit, after you right. inherit, that would be taxed. Fifty percent of that would be taxed, and after that, every dollar after two hundred and fifty thousand, 
60 to 66 percent that would be included. Okay. Well, I, I had a yeah. general understanding. I just misunderstood some of it. But yeah, primary residence is not affected. Yeah, that's right. Primary residence is, so it's, but it's people that they're, they're, they're sitting there and they're talking about, so, well, you know, like we got a cottage. What if I inherited it? And it's like, yeah, but it's not going to be like if the parents got the cottage 80 years ago. It's not going to be those 80 years of cattle gains plus that you have it. Yeah. Those, all the time that your parents had it, that's cleared at the time of disposition with the estate. And then your capital gains start. So if you get it and sell it right away, and say make twenty five thousand dollars on it, mm. it's just twenty five thousand dollars capital. Like just at the regular, because it's your second home, not your primary right. residence. Right. right. Well, and so it's a, there's a there's a lot of things being bandied about. Are not, they're not. Yeah, they're not uh, really understanding. This. Well, lifetime and is one point two five million. Okay. Yes, lifetime is 1.25 million. So, yes, when the when the federal government, when Christopher Freeland says it will only affect 0.13 percent, like that is the one on individuals, right? Right, larger corporations and stuff like that. Yes, there are a few of us, like when they're talking about like independent contractors and stuff like that, independent professionals like doctors, if they had everything in the business and they didn't, you know, take out RSP and use other savings for retirement this oh this is in my retirement you so, yeah people who have one time lifetime disposition that might have accumulated over 250 yeah they will be cut but again how many of that is how many of those are us mm-hmm. and how many of those are because of work independent contractors professionals yes because of work but it's not like they can't arrange their affairs in other ways as well they don't have to put their entire revenue we're saving into the value of the organization or the business and then sell it and say, hey, I'm going to make off good with capital gains. They can contribute to a CFSA. They can contribute to an RFP. Oh, yes. Can, by, right? They, they have other, with some, and, and the, unless they're going to sell their practice in like the next year, they, they have some time with tax plan with their accountants and to make all of that happen and lessen the date. So there's a very few people out there that are going to inherit something and then you know immediately dispose of it and right. pick up another two hundred fifty thousand capital games. Oh, lost them again. I don't know what happened there. One of the other things I read in the last few days about the capital gains tax uh, increase is the, the is all of a sudden, according to the Globe and Mail, apparently there will be a um, a, a great amount of let's put it right on screen there. Um, amount of people trying to sell their cottages all of a sudden because they're afraid they're going to get hammered on the capital gains tax. And I'm like, oh, really? So you may, what you're saying is you're going to suddenly flood the market with cottages, which will reduce the um, the purchasing uh, price. The price will drop. Uh, so in the end, if all these people dump their cottages onto the market to sell them, it'll just drop the price across the board and we'll have more cottages available for you or I to purchase, which I can't purchase. But I read that in the Globe and Mail the other day that there's, you know, tons of people that are getting ready to sell their cottage because they're afraid of the capital gains tax. I just thought this is hilarious. This is fear mongering is all this is. Yeah, absolutely. That's all it is because I mean, really, so you've had a family cottage for, I don't know, 50 years. Oh, I better sell it before the capital gains tax hits me. So you, you're never going to use it again. You're just going to put it on the market right now, and everybody's going to start doing that. Really, really, really. really. <laughs> Come on. Come so on. Businesses, so businesses are all going to pack up and leave. Everybody's going to get dinged on their principal residence, yeah. and like stuff that they inherit, and all the doctors are just going to up and leave. That's how they're trying yeah, it's, to get. It's absurdid, absurdity. It, it's not going. To. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, other, uh, the other bit of news, um, and I hesitate. Why? I don't know what's happening. Somebody must have complained. There's somebody down there using the room. Yeah, somebody who lives in the building who has the right to use the room. Please tell me what the problem is. He's sitting next to the meeting room where he's having a meeting. <laughs> it's like, oh boy, I um. Yeah, some days you just you just don't know what to think. And today's one of those days I don't know what to think. I see that uh, Christy Nome is still trending. I don't know if you're aware of um, Christy Nome or who she is. She's the um, governor of um, 
South Dakota, and she wrote a book recently. And in her book, she bragged about, um, well, for want of a better term, extinguishing the life of her puppy because she said the puppy was untrainable. So she pulled out a pistol and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, just, I just don't know what to think about that. Oh, there's Mr. Beaver. He's back again. All right, uh, I'm going to have to try and go back upstairs because now it's saying that I, the battery is shutting down because my phone is apparently too hot. Oh, yeah. I've just, I've just gone through, apparently, I've just gone through two gigabyte, gigabytes of personal bandwidth uh, because it has been, hasn't been connecting to the hotspot downstairs. Oh. Uh, I'm just going to go back to my unit. And, uh, okay, no problem. Try again. Uh, here, uh, I will send you this in the meantime, though. Uh, if you, uh, that's um, Umar Zamir okay. speaking. Uh, because I wanted to talk about you know, this. Okay, well, and I'll get to that in just a sec. I get upstairs. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'll get to that in just a sec. I was just hey, talking about sorry, South Dakota Governor Christy Noem and, and her horrible behavior of recent. Oh, God. Yeah, Christy yeah, Noem. So anyway. this was, uh, I got a picture of her puppy dog, that um, okay. cricket, uh, German short-haired pointer. Okay, we'll see you in a few minutes, sir. Her German sh short-haired pointer that uh, she decided that he was untrainable, so that chose to um, uh, pull out a pistol and, uh, yeah, that, that beautiful little animal is no longer with us because the governor of uh, South Dakota is a psychopath, clearly. Uh, it's disturbing to think that somebody would do that to a defenseless animal, but this she seems to think she was going to win points with some of the MAGA people by doing that. And I'm like, um, yeah, that's not really working well in her favor because most people love dogs. I know there are some people who don't. I know there are some people who are afraid of them. And I know people who are afraid of dogs but still love them because dogs just give you love. And my dog has made a tremendous difference in my life from both... Um, helping to alleviate my depression and my anxiety along with the medication and the work I put into it. It's just made my life that much better. And here's, you know, she's, this woman said her dog was untrainable and, and all these people replying to her responses with, yeah, my dog's untrainable too. And I wouldn't change a damn thing about it. This is my dog that I found on the side of the road. And if I leave him alone for too long, he shreds all my furniture and I don't care. He's a good dog. I've given him a good life. So this woman is man oh man like <laughs> I, I she's getting pilloried and justifiably so she should be getting pilloried for this this is not normal human behavior you know who else did that sort of thing there's a list of individuals who used to do that sort of thing psychotic serial killers who killed dogs before people jeffrey dahmer david berkowitz Edmund Kemper, I don't know if you know who he was, but yikes, uh, Ted Bundy. Edmund Kemper was featured in um, that FBI series a few years ago, the profiling series that was on Netflix. Edmund Kemper was, he's still in prison, and they say he's a model prisoner. He's about six foot nine, about 360 pounds. He's a big, big man, complete psychopath. Dennis Rader, I'm not sure who that is, and Alberta DeSalvo, but these were all serial killers that started with killing dogs first. So, she is a special individual who is going to receive some special treatment from social media over the next little while. Because I don't know a person, like I said, I know people who uh, might be afraid of dogs, but I don't know many who hate them. The vast majority of, of North Americans, I'd say, well, vast majority of people around the world love dogs. So that uh, Mindhunter, yes, thank you, Carol. That was the name of the show, Mindhunter, the series. Edmund Kemper was featured. He was the guy they kept interviewing. Uh, and uh, on, oh, Raiders, the BDK killer. Okay, right. Thank you. Can't keep everybody's name straight sometimes. I'm, I'm old and tired, and I only I got a couple hours sleep last night. But uh, let's move on from that horrible news. And I have the clip of uh, Umar Zamir speaking, which we haven't shown yet. So I will... I will show this right now. It's about a two-minute clip. We'll have a look at this, and uh, 
we'll see you on the other side. Hang on here. Let's just hit play. That's there we go. Never meant any of this to happen. I am sorry for what had happened, but I never meant any of this to happen to this day. I can't thank enough to Mr. Nader, Mr. Alex. I can just say this, these are not just the lawyers, these are angels for me. They work not just for this case, they work for the truth. When Nader first came to me, when I was in the detention center and he asked, I asked him, how would you pursue, how would you go with my case? He said, I know it's very complex, but I know I'm dealing with the truth and I won't leave you by your side. Just before the verdict, he only said me one thing, no matter what the verdict will come, I will be with your side now, later, and always been with So Nade, thank you very much. Alex, thank you very much. She is someone who not just gave me the advice of lawyers, who has been giving me advices on so many other issues. And Alex, I can't thank you enough. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nade. And I can't thank enough the whole Canada. I thought I and Ida made a wrong decision when we thought we should go to Canada. It's a better place for our kids. But I think today I see that Canada didn't let injustice to happen. So I thank Canada. Thank you very much. That's a uh, pretty stirring uh, soliloquy from a, a man who had his life, you know, mostly destroyed. And the three years of his life that... Uh, he spent defending himself that he can never get back, of course. You know, in the, sorry, I've got alarms going off here. Uh, when the judge said, you know, I in the rare, rare occasion where a judge apologizes for the travesty of justice, he says, you, you, you know, I'm so very sorry for what has happened to you. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an extreme circumstance. And, and what happened to him was terrible. Uh, and a life was lost in the process. But he was innocent of what they tried to convict him of. And, you know, as the saying goes, it all comes out in the wash. And it did, thankfully. Uh, yeah. Justice was served. Yes. But uh, not only justice was served, uh, but uh, thank God for closer to the video cameras. I can barely hear you, sir. So, oh, okay, maybe uh, the head. Yeah, take them out, maybe. You're, 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 uh, it's one of the. It's Monday, man. Stuff always goes sideways on Mondays. There, that's better. Yeah, much better. Things go sideways on Mondays. Yeah, yeah you were really muffled. Right. Now you're clear. I can hear you loud and clear now. Perfect. So uh, the other thing is, um, thank God for closed circuit TV. Yeah. Thank God for video. Yeah. No kidding. He'd be in jail. They would have railroaded him. Oh yeah, and they tried to. And the premier would have cheered. Yeah. And so would have yeah. the former mayor. Well, they, you know, we saw what they did, yeah. right? So. The former mayor, John Tory, uh, kind of backed that truck up really quickly. Yeah. Sure. It's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Can you tell that John Tory is a lawyer and doesn't want to get sued? <laughs> and Doug Ford kind of also sort of, not as much as John Tory did, but sort of took a bit of a step back too but yeah they um they were perfectly happy with railroading him when they thought it was just a, a brown immigrant yeah i mean they I actually they said get away with it they actually said that the police officer that had gotten hit whose life was tragically lost in this horrible accident was actually standing in front of the car with this like or standing uh, either in the front or the back of the car, wherever it is, with his hands up going, no, 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 no. And so everybody says, yeah, we saw it. And then look at the video. It's like, yeah, and that never happened. Yeah. Yeah. 
never happened. And they never identified they themselves. Lied. As <laughs> they just lied. And, and you know, the, here's the and thing. All the stories corroborated. They all told the same lie. Yeah, well, th they should know better than to try that because there's cameras everywhere today. Everybody knows this, right? But people still behave terribly on camera daily. <laughs> I just don't get it. Yeah. Somebody's always watching somewhere, so maybe, maybe, maybe don't behave in that manner. Yeah. Somebody is yeah. always watching somewhere. <laughs> and uh, what uh, Mr. Zamir had to say. Yes. I think that all of that just speaks for itself. His demeanor is calm. Yeah. The words he had to say, what he had to say about Canada, what he had to say about his lawyers. Yeah. Well, and Linda's got a very, very good comment here. Uh, it wasn't just the police. The the Crown Attorney should have never let the case get to court, knowing the evidence. Yes. Like, eh, you're right. Yes, but somebody wanted to. Somebody wanted to win. Yeah. Prosecutor wanted to win, so they went anyway. Yeah, and and this. You and know, here this I don't get it side. because it, it's not like the United States, where prosecutors and DAs then run for office. Yeah, no, that's it's not the case here. So it's like it's not like you have to. It's not like you have to railroad person. What person to say, hey, I snatched that, and then then yeah. run on it here in Canada. So there's no there's no excuse for it other than just outright racism. That's all. Yeah. Well, and and the comment from Mr. Cal, uh, people complain about cameras in public spaces. Well, this this one saved a man. You know, there's a tragic a accident. Family. A man lost his life, and then they tried to hold another man responsible for it when clearly there was a collusion amongst the. Uh, thin blue line to make sure that they could send this brown man to prison except the evidence does not support their story even though it was corroborated by them the evidence is shoots not the just spray a, all day not hell, just a right? brown man eh? a brown man with a two-year-old child yes a wife who was pregnant yeah yeah so they were perfectly willing to put a brown man in jail take a mm -hmm. husband away from his wife and take a father away from two kids For what? Yeah. Because a police officer died and someone must pay. Mm -hmm. Nope. Nope. Not all the time. No. It was often, a tragic accident. Most often when a police officer dies in the line of duty, something happened. Mm -hmm. Not every time. That's why we have a legal system mm -hmm. for the not every time. And thankfully, it worked. It worked properly this time. Fortunately. Yes. Um, so, but speaking of people who behave badly in front of camera. Oh, what, what, what? I hesitate to get into this because mm -hmm. every time we mention her name. Oh, yeah, I know. Lose their minds in the chat. Deanna. Yes. Kids, please keep it civil. Please keep it civil. She was uh, arrested and charged. And it seems that there was an initial court hearing, the, the first court hearing, and she was denied bail. Yeah, that's a little telling, now, isn't it? Yes. Now, there was several people arrested um, in uh, in this uh in this incident she was one uh so there were several uh cases going on and um she had been charged with um a few things unfortunately i don't have it right up on my screen so i will uh, uh i will i will bring it up um but it seems that um as we've seen in videos and people have a reputation based on their actions mm -hmm. um she does have a tendency uh, of liking to use her uh, megaphone as a weapon, allegedly. allegedly. Uh, we have seen her uh, in several instances hit people with it. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, some might say it might be a little bit of self-defense, as in, in some instances, maybe people were stepping to her and said back off, but hitting someone with an object is not legally how we tell people to back off. Um, <laughs> uh, but it seems that this time um, she may have hit. 
I'm not completely clear on everything, but uh, she may have hit uh, someone in uh, law enforcement while they were trying to enforce the law. And it would seem that maybe this time was the one time too many. Um, now, if that is indeed the case, um, we still have an issue of why is it that she gets arrested only when she hits an officer of the law with something? and not the average person, because it's not like there isn't video of her doing it. Um, here's the thing, uh, and this is this, for us, this is not difficult because it's the same standard we had for the convoy. Mm -hmm. And when we had the convoy, we kept on saying, you do have a right to protest. Yeah. You just don't have a right to protest any damn way you please. There are rules. <laughs> so at the same time, there are rules. There are always rules. There well, that's, how we always. Keep a, that's how we keep things uh, safe and in order, and we don't want to be complete chaos or anarchy. That's why there's rules. You might not like the rules, but you should damn well play within them. And there are always going to be adults in the room. Oh yes, but and, but, and, and one of the things I've said from, from one of the things I've said from day one uh, is that I don't necessarily disagree with the message. I disagree with the method. Exactly, but that's because I mean, I, I I think very much fall in line with a lot of the things she's trying to uh, support and protect and promote. I just disagree with the manner in which she did it because behaving like a convoy occupationist is not the way to get it done. It's not. And I've had people say, well, you went out and yelled at him in the street. Yeah, I did. One time. I had my peace and then I walked away. I did my protest and walked away. I didn't continue to harass people, even though they are terrible people. And they are. I didn't continue to harass them. I just tried to live my life. She has been weaponized and promoted through social media. And yeah. uh, I, I don't know the person. I've never met her. I don't know what she's like as a human being. And again, I largely agree with the, the, the causes she's supporting. I just disagree with her method. Yeah. Well, as we mentioned on the show again, when the convoy people said, I was arrested for what I believe. No, you were not. No, that's you not were, why you were arrested. You were actions you posed, decisions you made, choices you made in furtherance of those beliefs. And this is the exact same standard that's being applied here. Regardless of the nobility of your cause, mm -hmm. if in furtherance of it, you pose illegal actions, or you're thinking you're justified to pose illegal actions because the cause is that important or the enemy is that evil, the law applies equally to you. Whether you approach this from the political left or the political right, the further you go to the extremes or to the fringe, the more likely it is that the law is going to see no difference between you. To answer your question, who promoted her? People on Twitter. By retweeting, resharing, constantly. Not one individual, hundreds of individuals promoted her. Not one person. People saw her videos, they liked it. They retweeted it. They shared it. People did that. That's how it gets promoted. It's as simple as that. You go Word of mouth, just, just like our show gets promoted. Yeah. Word of people mouth. People see us. They like what we do. They share it. They tell people, hey, watch this. It's, it's, it's no difference. The there was, there was no main one. There was no main one. There wasn't. I never no. said that. It was promoted by many, many people online. Period. She's very good. These tactics while we don't approve of them because some of them are illegal mm -hmm. just as was the case when black lives matter toronto held up the pride parade mm -hmm. i really see a smoke bomb uh 
right? You don't do these types of things. This, is it effective? Yes. Does it get you media coverage? Absolutely. Will it earn you fans who are like-minded? Absolutely. Will it earn you a whole bunch of people saying, yeah, you did the right thing and we'll support you and, you know, feed your echo chamber and, you know, create a, a narrative that says that you're in the right and everything. Yeah. And the law doesn't care. Mm -hmm. The law doesn't care. So 10,000 people supported me. They approved of my, yeah, the law doesn't care. Here's a, here's a, a quote from at corn kernel pop prairie grass. You know, the bottom line here is people think they have the freedom to do and say whatever they want, despite impact on anyone. And the internet gives them a platform to brag and show off. And people like the post, which results in positive feedback. Rinse and repeat. You get that little shot to the brain of um, adrenaline. Adrenaline, yep. that's not the right. You, you know what I mean? You get that little boost. Serotonin, get, serotonin boost. Thank you. Serotonin boost. When, you, when people, you see people like what you did. So rinse and repeat. This formula works. I'll continue to do it. And that's what it boils down to. That's basically the reason why people say whiteness is one hell of a drug when they look at white supremacists protesting and mm -hmm. they get all that approval and then they go back and do it again. It's one hell of a drug. It's, it's a variation on the theme. Mm -hmm. Remember when our parents used to tell us, oh, if Johnny, if John, if Johnny would jump off a bridge, would you? 10,000 people doing a stupid thing doesn't make the thing being done less stupid. This is not a popular vote thing. It's not, it's, it's not, it's, it's illegal unless you get 50,000 likes, then you can hit that person. With your it's not how the law works. The law doesn't care how many people like or approve of what you did. If the thing you did is illegal, you have to go in court and say that you were justified in breaking the law. And there are very few reasons. Like for example, self-defense gives you a right to hit someone, but it only gives you a right to hit someone with proportional force, enough to neutralize the threat. Doesn't allow you to take someone out. You know, uh, Deanna's right. long said, protect trans youth. I agree with her. Absolutely. That's not up for debate. Not, not up, up for, for debate. debate. Protect trans youth. Uh, protect the rainbow community. Yes. Causes are not agree. methods. But the manner in which you do it, you know, in in the 60s and 70s, you had radical left-wingers who, well, you remember people who would uh, raid, like, I think, I'm not going to say the name of the organization, but it's um, about treating animals ethically. Yeah. They would raid laboratories and release animals. I'm like, well, that, you know, then then they'd damage and they'd storm college campuses. And I get what you're trying to do. You're just going about it in the wrong manner. If we're going to live... In a civilized society, we have to be civil to one another. And when you throw out civility, well, what comes next? Anarchy. And everybody just wipes the rules right off the sheet. And does whatever they want. And, and we, can't, we can't be doing that. Yeah. Now, certain media mentioned her name. Certain media just said 47-year-old person or 47-year-old women. People started yelling and screaming. You got to Say her name. You got to hold her responsible. And other people don't get into that stuff. That's just mm. wasted energy. Right? And no, but, to answer your question, I know the convoy was not civilized, and that's a, that's the case. I'm saying that type of behavior is not standard. civilized. Yep, we're using the exact same standard. So yeah. she was. Uh, They're held uh, to has, the same standard. Yep. Has, on this show, we're holding the same standard. Has been identified and charged with assault of a police officer with intent to prevent an arrest obstructing a police officer in the execution of their duty, assault with a weapon, times two, possession of a weapon dangerous to the public, harassment by threatening conduct, hate motivated, times two, and intimidation uh, by disorderly fall. Um, like I said, had the initial hearing, she was denied bail, so considered mm -hmm. dangerous enough to be denied bail. Um, as was the case for certain convoy protesters, some were get granted bail and release, and some were deemed too dangerous, or maybe not remorseful. Showed no remorse. 
Um, I'm not celebrating. No. No. I'm not celebrating. Uh, but I always try to be honest uh, about what I feel and how I see it. Um, I think a lot of you would be surprised if you saw me here today going, oh, my God, they arrested her. I'm so surprised. I'm shocked. not. I'm not. For me, this happening was only a question of when, not if. Mm -hmm. And well, yeah, I will be also uh, very honest. Law enforcement probably did her a great disservice by not arresting her earlier. I think so. Um, when there was a video of her hitting and just a private citizen, yeah, there probably would have been a legal thing, but it's not going to be as bad as hitting a police officer. Maybe if somebody had intervened a little earlier, um, it might not have gotten this far. I need, I need, I need, uh, I need you to understand something here. There may be a publication ban on this case, but we're not publishers. Number one, number two, we are not throwing anything in there that isn't already in the public realm. We also didn't watch the hearing, so no. we have no information Zero. inside the courtroom to share. That would violate the publication ban as well. We can't get into trouble for talking about what is in the public sphere. Period. We can't. This is public knowledge. We did not attend the hearing. We don't know what took place there. I don't even know all the charges. Publication ban does not apply to us. We're not publishers. It's as simple as that. Hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. That that part I'm not sure. Had we been in the courtroom and had we been you know, and talked about it, that would be a different story. But we we're not. Been, yeah, but we're not. So I mean, I I, I think it could technically apply to us. Um, uh, you know, if somebody online shared information that was covered by the publication ban, and then that gets out. Um, yes, you know, if we happen to share that and we find that out, we'd obviously apologize mm -hmm. for that. Uh, but uh, that someone has been charged, what they have been charged with, and things that they've done before that they were charged that is on video, that's stuff we can, that, that's easily, you, you, you can talk about. Well, so from that, that's Toronto, that. Dan, here, there's a publication ban on details of the bail hearing and specifics of the case. The charges are open to discussion. I watched the hearing and heard exactly what the judge said. We didn't see the bail hearing, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what took place. Yeah, so we're just discussing. All I know, all I know is that there was a hearing, mm -hmm. and her bail was denied. That's all I know. Yeah, that's it. I don't know if she was belligerent. I don't know if she was compliant. I don't know if she was cooperative. No I idea. don't know. Nothing. I know absolutely nothing. There was a bail hearing. Hearing. There was there was an arrest. There were charges. There was a bail hearing. It was denied. Mm -hmm. That's all we know. And, and you know and what I the charges are. I think you are correct, sir, in saying that I, I don't think the police did her any favors by letting it go this long, because no. what happens is when you get away with something for a while, you and feel emboldened to do it more and more and more. And I think, you know, in, in this instance, they did not do her any favors. They should have charged her sooner, which would be lesser charges. This is just speculation, lesser mm -hmm. charges, lesser problems. You could have nipped it in the bud. It, it might have been the wake-up call needed, and it, it might not have been. I don't know. We don't know. We don't know. But it would have been given someone a chance at least. Because yes. this is, there is, listen, there is, no matter how much one may like her or disapprove of her, right? the fact is <laughs> that there is, at least in Canada, and in most, you know, sort of G7, G20 developed nations, there is no dimension, solar system, universe, galaxy, planet, continent, country, area code, or postal code in which hitting an officer of the peace ends up well for you. Mm, indeed. It just doesn't happen. So before we start screaming 
either you know, hero and martyr or trash and you had it coming. Mm -hmm. Whatever side, it's like there are some basic facts here. Like I said, hitting, making a choice to hit an officer of the peace. That's probably not going to be your wisest life decision. No. Objectively. Right. Uh, so this happened. Um, you have to mention it. Yeah. Because it, it is big news. Um, for me, it's right up there with the, the Tamara Leach stuff as well. It's like, you have to mention it when it happens. Yeah. Uh, but it's not fun to talk about and you don't want to give them too much time. Um, you have some people um, like slap happy mm -hmm. uh, trying to use this saying, you know, you know, Deanna is horrible and like compared to Tamara who never did anything violent. It was like, girl, girl, I think by any objective measure, we can say that Tamara is way worse in terms of the behavior she has exhibited. Um, I mean, she's trying to counsel people to overthrow government. Yes. <laughs> so, and let, let's not forget that she was part of the Maverick Party in Alberta, which was yes. a, it's a Wexit party, right? We're, 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 we're not in the same ballparks here. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't also, you know, the, the right is trying to weaponize Deanna's arrest and say, you know, like this, oh my God, to, to elevate the people on its side. Um, for people doing the, the whataboutism thing, whether it's going to be from the left or the right, um, just realize that while you may be looking at the nobility or your perceived nobility of your cause first, and mm -hmm. then all your judgments based on that, um, the law is probably looking at Tamara Leach and Deanna Sheriff as being flip sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. So I know there's whatever the movements need to say to their members and to themselves to keep the motivation going and those things are sometimes reality based and sometimes there's a little embellishment or whatnot, you know, just to rally yeah. the troops a little bit. Um, I would be very cautious about going all in on a victim or martyr narrative for mm -hmm. her if you support her. Uh, Tread lightly. Not tread lightly. And it's not like tread lightly for you know, something terrible will happen to you. No, 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 no. Just be cautious. That's all. Care about the value of your word. Mm -hmm. And if you care about people wanting, being open to listen to what you have to say, and it's not so much people that already agree with you, but these movements are supposed to be exercises in persuasion. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to present your argument and be either more emotionally compelling or logically compelling or whatever centers that because people respond to different things. Some people respond more to logic. Some people respond to appeals to emotions. Some people, but however it is you're delivering your message that you, you know, meet the people that are undecided, that you persuade them, you know, gently bring them to your cause. Mm -hmm. That's protection. And then there's coercion, believe in what I believe or else something bad's going to happen. And that's not good. Right. We so, have an entire political party like that right now in this country. Religion. Yeah. You want to uh, you want to, or else you're going to burn forever. That's so, something that just came across my feed that you may find interesting, yeah, sir. Yeah. Is it about this? Um, it's related to, to it. Little, this little it's related to it. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll bring it up after you're done, but I just wanted yeah. to give you the heads up. I'm going to grab a coffee at the same time because I'm, I'm falling asleep. <laughs> Right so I, I, yeah, so I, I, I just want you to know that if, if you are putting the cause first, 
when you're fighting for the same things that she is fighting, right? If you actually want to persuade and bring people to your cause, and it's not about I'm right and I need you to tell me I'm right, right? So if it's not about being right, if it's about persuading and convincing, doing the hard work of bringing people along and seeing things your way without threats, without violence, just on the power of your argument or on the nobility of your cause. Even though things like this may happen to people like Deanna, I think it's Deanna, I hope I'm saying it right, I'm sorry, um, or Dina or Deanna, um, whether you support that, or if you do support that, um, you always have to separate the cause from the actions from the people. And if the cause is first, there will be time where people who share the same objectives as you as to wanting to reach the cause, but that employ methods that may not be the most conducive to actually getting to the destination there might be a time where you have to be more careful with how vocal you are going to be in defending that person or in defending that person's actions so that you maintain your own credibility and your own ability to persuade. Because there is a group of people that you are seeking to persuade who may see what it is that she's done and she's then say themselves also going, you know what, that's it, that's my stop. I can't, you know, it's, I want trans kids to be respected and loved and all that kind of stuff, but I can't, I, I, I can't support people, you know, assaulting other people I, the, the, to, to get there. That's, that, 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 that's my line. I can't stop that. If you're all in on the fight and you're going, she's a hero, she did right. The police was out to get her and everybody screwed her over and this you're probably going to lose those people or your opportunity to persuade them. Sometimes having stronger or more militant language helps you or doing things that can embarrass other people helps you. Because I know this because I'm from the gay community and back in the days of the HIV AIDS epidemic when things were really bad, people would stage diets they would go to the headquarters of a pharmaceutical company. They'd all lie in the street and they'd do chalk, outline, chalk outlines, stop traffic for a while. Say, these are how many people are dealing. You're killing or are dying because you haven't made drugs available at a good price or all that kind of stuff. Yes. But there was no violence. Yes, we inconvenienced people. We stopped traffic, whatnot. We had to die in. You know, we did something big and spectacular that got us on the news, but nobody was threatened. There was no violence. And we basically tried to shame the pharmaceutical companies and governments to doing the right thing. We tried to paint ourselves as sympathetic so that, oh my word, I apologize, kids, I'm having that trouble today here. Uh, we tried to paint ourselves as sympathetic so that we could get the public on our side because we knew that everybody, we knew that everybody knew somebody who was gay, but we just weren't out. And then visibility at every costs or at all costs became a thing. But we did the slow work of persuading people gently. You know people. There are people in your life. These are not just strangers or people, other people that are somewhere else that you'll never meet. You actually have relations. And that that mattered. So 
And I'm seeing that in the chat, some people are not doing what we asked you to do. He said, I so yeah. you, you have to understand those of you who thinks that these tactics are appropriate. Those of you who thinks that it's appropriate to go into other people's homes and not follow the rules of the house. Don't be surprised if eventually people tell you, the homeowner tells you you're not welcome here. Mm -hmm. There's only so many times that people are going to allow you in their home and allow you to piss on the carpets and relieve yourself on the, on the floor and wipe yourself on the drapes before they say, you know what, we're tired of the cleaning bill. It's not that we don't like you. It's just that you don't respect our space and you're making um, everyone else uncomfortable. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, so, um, Reed, Reed did the thing. Reed did the thing that needed to be done. Thanks, Reed. That's why you have the wrench. Yep. You know, and that's the thing. It's like, if you, if you start to, if you come on here and start abusing people, mm, no, no. Look, we we can sometimes let our emotions get the better of us. I know you've seen me do that. <laughs> but I tend to call out bad people doing bad things. We're just discussing something that took place. And we're not going to allow you to abuse anybody. So that's yes, you know. just not our vibe. Thanks, Ree. Appreciate that. And I hope that I'm showing by the manner in which i mean you see me trying to choose my words i'm speaking more slowly i'm trying to be cautious and i'm trying mm -hmm. to be judicious oh yes no no it's because i know i know that we have listeners who approve of methods that might be a little more militant that might be a little more aggressive a little more in your face mm -hmm. i know we have people that believe you know what sometimes the cause just matters too much you have to and you know what you're right Sometimes there is a moment where a cause is important enough and you have to make a choice and you have to make a choice to break a rule. That does happen. But those should be exceptional moments. Shouldn't be your standard operating procedure. Yeah. Right? It's like the difference between someone who swears all the time and someone who only swears now and then. Like someone you almost never hear swear, and all of a sudden they say, you know, then the you turn around and say, whoa, what the hell? It gets noticed because it's used sparingly. So you know that when it happens, the person meant it. If you start everything up at volume 11. Yeah, it's hard to dial it down. Right. Let's go. I got to so, let's, let's go for a palate cleanse here. So I just wanted to let people know. So it's, I, I'm trying to be considerate of everyone's opinion, but there are certain facts in life. Mm -hmm. like this, and you cannot break the flow. The nobility of your cause does not entitle you to break the law. And assaulting people or putting hands on people without their permission is always wrong. Yes. Always wrong. <sighs> so... All right. We talked about it because There's it is new. Yeah. There's our palate cleanse. There's our palate cleanse. There we go. So we talked this about it because it's news. There was an mm -hmm. arrest. It is a big deal. And now we move on. We don't rejoice. We don't no. celebrate. Yes. But also, if we are reasonable, rational people who are tethered to reality and that are looking at it, let's not pretend we're surprised. All right. Okay. So in relation to that, in relation to that, yes. uh, Red Deer South Constituency Board urges Premier to forgive regional MLA for offensive remarks. And it was uh, Lacombe Ponoka, MLA Jennifer Johnson, 
Johnson was expelled from the UCP's caucus after making offensive remarks in 2022 comparing transgender children in school to feces and cookie dough. So her, U- UCP her party leader Johnson. Danielle Smith had said at the time that Johnson could not sit with the caucus if elected. And Red Deer's uh, South Constituency Board urges the Premier to forgive her. That's kind of a, I'm sorry, what? I beg your pardon? Yeah, all of you are begging for her to forgive her. Fuck you too. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, it's dropped two f bombs in the last couple of minutes, but um, I, I'm just borrowing that from Lisa, by the way. Mm-hmm. We love. Who, whenever Jennifer Johnson comes up in conversation, she tells her. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry, you, you compared kids. children to fecal matter. No. No, yeah. no, you get told to fuck off. Yeah, yeah, you do, and proud to do it. By the way, and, and that's not a difference of opinion. That's not an opinion. You compared children to fecal matter. That that that's not an opinion. That's a belief system, and a bad one at that, because you're denying them their basic humanity. These are children who are struggling with their identity and you're denying their humanity. So, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you to, to go home in, in the most passive-aggressive way I can think of. Thank you, darling, but we're full up. You can, you can go home now. Um, uh, I would politely invite you to run an ultramarathon off the world's shortest pier. But... Um, that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kit Cassie did mention something about a change in the subject, talking about um, the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful premiere of uh, Manitoba, Mr. Wab Canoe, who uh, the other day, Mr. Grizzly, uh, I just sent you a, a link with an image that you can uh, show the kids, the other day was caught. Um, on camera, being Wab Canoe. Oh, yes, I do have this right here. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Wab so, doing what Wab does. This was from about a week ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is from Global, says, Manitoba Premier Wab Canoe wearing a suit and tie stopped to help. Stopped to help change a woman's tire on the side of the dirt road Saturday, and a photo of his effort is garnering significant traction online. The image taken by Tasha Spillett and uploaded by her aunt is now making its rounds on the platform like Facebook, Instagram, and Reddit. As of Monday afternoon, the Facebook post had more than 700,000 views. That was Monday last week, of course. It's kind of funny to me because I took that picture actually just to show my husband that help had arrived, Spillett told Global News, adding that she did not expect it would get this much attention. (laughs) <laughs> hmm. Hi, honey, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm really fine. <laughs> Spillett was coming home from her late father-in-law's funeral. Oh. And blew a tire. Wow. Yeah, just <laughs> talk about piling it oh, on. Oh, right? no. You know what? That makes this all the more better because when you're coming back from a funeral, it's, well, most people are not skipping and dancing. <laughs> so uh for a good samaritan to just you know fall out of the sky and the, the last thing you need is a flat tire when you're coming back from referral oh yeah and that's sort of like huh, can you imagine like it's like good bad day i went to a funeral worst day then i got a flat tire good yeah. day somebody helped great day it was the premier of my province <laughs> <laughs> right Does everybody hate pants no, no. non sequitur <laughs> um, and you're right you're right that's exactly when a flat tire happens right the worst yes, possible time exactly so uh apparently premier canoe said uh, it's what it was what any decent manitoban would do help somebody out just wanted to help her out and make sure she got home safely canoe told global news and people are saying, oh, it's, he's just doing a photo op in it. No, no, that was actually not the case at all. Yeah. I mean, we know there's lots of photo ops that, are, that, that take place all the time, but this was not that. 
this just simply I'm was not that. People, he's a good egg. I, I I know that there's a faction that may not be equipped by the fact that someone who's progressive might actually be a decent person too, like in real yeah. life. But it happens. It's kind of our jam, decency, you know. <laughs> <laughs> At Kitlin Dam, uh, he did say he would work for everyone. Well, this is true, right? <laughs> hey, if he's willing, if he's willing to get down in the dirt and actually get grease on his hands, mm -hmm. hey, what more can yeah, yeah, Kit Saucy protect him at all costs? Oh, Kit Cassie, notice Wop kept his shirt tucked in, unlike PB. Oh, oh. Well, um... <laughs> Cassie, you can sit next to me. <laughs> oh, man, that was uh, that 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 was that was a little saucy. I have to say, I I approve. <laughs> uh, Mr. Grizzly, do you have anything? Um, I have something that, that Cassie just sent me. Uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm a little troubled by this. Um, this is from April 4th, actually. I, I'm going to put this on the screen here for you, and we'll, we'll go through this. Um, this is uh, from, okay, it's local, steinbeckonline.com, Steinbach, Steinbach. Anyway, yeah, S-T-E-I-N-B-A-C-H, SteinbachOnline.com. I'm not familiar with SteinbachOnline.com, but I will pay attention to it now. Local news, Hanover, this is in Alberta, Hanover trustees reassert authority in teacher hiring process after decade-long absence. In a close vote Tuesday, uh, Tuesday night, a motion was passed by the Hanover School Board that will see a change in the way teachers are hired for music and physical education. Before the motion was presented, Ron Falk asked, Falk, F -A -L -K, asked the board chair why this topic was put before the trustees only a year after it had been discussed by the board. I'm wondering why. Is there something that's changed? Is there new information? What is changing that we're doing this? Falk questioned. Chair Brad Unger suggested that trustee Shane Barkman could answer those questions after introducing the motion. In quotations, or, uh, quote, I move that all music and gym teachers be hired the same way principals and vice principals are hired, said S. Barkman. My rationale for the motion is wanting this motion to have locally elected community representation in the hiring process of these teachers that are involved in the communities with sports and music concerts. Community relationships are so important, and this would be a healthy way to strengthen these community relationships with our schools, our parents, with our students. Most parents will know the music teacher and the gym teacher in their schools because they are on the front lines making many of these community events possible. The motion asked Barkman presented a year ago was for mandatory trustee presence at least two trustees at all interviews for teachers across the division. It was defeated with only garnering three votes from Barkman, Friesen, and Barkman. S. Barkman then put forth an amended motion that would allow trustees to be present rather than require their presence. There was no seconder for that motion, so it never made it to a vote. With this new motion before the board, Barkman said it would be good to have trustees involved in these interviews, strengthening the hiring process for these key community members. Falk then questioned again why the board was revisiting this topic after it already made a decision a year ago. Our board already talked about this within the last year, and we determined that we were not going to be involved in teacher interviews, said Falk, questioning why the board would now consider being involved in the interviews for these two groups of teachers. S. Barkman was given a chance to respond to that inquiry. I just think that it's very important to get these hires right, and I just think that trustees know the community and know that constituents could definitely help out with the process, he said. And I think it would be beneficial for the school division as a whole. Jeff Friesen spoke in favor of the motion, saying that there would be a lot less hiring for teachers in the music and physical, ed physical education departments. Each school teacher that does phys ed or music, that might only be once every 10 years, 15 years per school, Friesen said. This isn't a big department, and I think it's a great idea to have a little more ears on the interview process that are going to be in our communities and affecting all ages for a very long time. Charmaine Taves voted against the motion last year and again spoke against them that it was placed before the board this week. As I said then, our board's focus should remain on governments, policy settings, strategic planning, and budget setting. 
Dave said on Tuesday evening. The size of our school division means there are resignations, leaves of absences, transfers, and hires each and every week. Asking the trustees to be involved in any hiring beyond administrative roles, such as superintendents and principals, means that we hamper the efforts of those that we have hired to do that work. The hiring of teachers and support staff is operational, and it does not make sense for us to commit time or energy to that endeavor when it is outside the role of the school board. We may lose out on good hires by slowing down this process. We hire great principals and leaders of the schools and our communities, and we trust that they also have the best interests of our students in mind when they hire these teachers. She continued, I would also argue that music and gym teachers, while we value them for their contact with each child in the school, are no different than any other teacher. They should not be treated differently upon hiring, and ultimately we have hired experts in their field to interview and choose qualified candidates and hire the best to teach in our schools. Taves concluded by questioning why the board would change something that seems to be working quite well. Danielle Funk also spoke out against the motion. It feels like micromanagement to me, she said. It's an overstep of the board to meddle in what's operational. We are saying to our admin and our principals who hire staff that they're not doing a good job in doing so and that we have better or more valuable opinions and a better ability to hire these people. It doesn't show trust in the people we've hired to do the jobs, and it also doesn't allow them to do their job without having to look over their shoulder because board members might choose to take over another job that they're supposed to do. Funk also said the board should not separate any teachers. A teacher is a teacher, and they can move into a position to teach music or gym, whether they were hired to do that or not. And it shouldn't be more difficult to be hired in any position by having more trustees in the room doing the hiring. At this point, Lynn Barkman asked Funk for clarification on her comments. Danielle, are you trying to say that in the past we meddled with the admin when we were part of the hiring? Funk responded by saying the school board of the day operated within the process that was approved during that time. And as a board, you guys decided that was no longer the appropriate process for this division, said Funk. Going back to say, yeah. We should be back in that room and hiring. That is meddling in what operations should be doing. It is micromanaging what their job is and sending a message that us, as a board, believe they're not capable of doing those jobs. L. Barkman responded, I disagree. Dallas Wiebe stated that he does not see it as a bad thing that the way the board is involved in the hiring of principals and vice principals. To this, Funk responded, there's a difference between us being involved in hiring the leaders of the school to us being involved with everybody who's going to be in the classroom or a portion of who is going to be in the classroom. Cheryl Froese, F-R-O-E-S-E, Froese, I guess, suggested that this motion would bring forward changes that would promote community engagement. This was followed by a discussion on whether this motion would make it mandatory for trustee involvement in these interviews or whether it would simply be an invitation to allow trustees the option of attending. Conversation turned to current procedure for hiring principals and vice principals. What that looks like and what this could mean if this motion was approved. After some discussion, S. Barkman said he would be willing to have the motion amended to state that music and phys ed teachers would be hired the same way that vice principals are hired. Taves urged trustees to carefully consider, sorry a second here, carefully consider what this motion means for the hiring process. This still means the board would be making the decision on the hiring and the principals could give their opinion, but they would actually have no say. Chairperson Unger opened the floor for Superintendent Shelley Amos to offer her thoughts on the topic. We've been through this before and I've spoken on it before, she said. I feel the need to say that the trustees have not been involved in this since 2010 and you're going backwards if you consider this. I feel like I need to say that it is actually the assistant superintendents who do the hiring. It is not the principals. Principals actually don't have the authority to hire. The assistant superintendents have the authority to hire. Amos noted that even though principals do not have hiring authority, they are involved in hiring teachers. They definitely give their recommendation because they know their school the best and they want the best for their school and the fit. So people involved in the hiring process really need to understand what's needed. People who are involved have to have an educational mindset to know what pedagogy, what practices, what experience counts. It is the role of senior administration to do that. It is not the role of the board to do that. Trustees voted on the motion, moved by trustee Shane Barkman and seconded by trustee Dallas Wiebe, that all music and gym teachers be hired the same way the vice principals are hired. The motion was carried five to four with votes in support. Here's what you need to understand. This is um, not local community activism as much as this is the um, right-wing Christian evangelicals getting involved at the trustee level on how they start to weed their curriculum in on how they want children to learn about what they want them to learn about, not what a provincial curriculum has been designed to teach. This is how it begins. 
That's how it started in the U.S. and how it can carry on in Canada if, again, we are not ever vigilant. There's just a couple of members on a trustee board who has just changed the rules for hiring music and gym teachers. They're taking things over, bit by bit, little by little, inch by inch. And none of this is good. I completely agree with you. Um, there's no place for this. This should not... Uh, you hire people to do a job. Period. You, you let them do the job. This is not... Uh, not okay. You, you have something to add? Well, I do. I, uh, I'm a, don't get me geeking out on pedagogy, because I will, but there's a, uh, I, I just wanted to say a shout out to Vim, who's a teacher. Um, my sister's also a teacher. Um, there's a, there's a school in Toronto, I'm forgetting the name, Vim, you'll know it, but they do feminist pedagogy and, uh, it's, they should be in charge of the world, I think. Um, my sister is, uh, I just wanted to ask for any uh, kind words that you'd like to send up for her. She's, a, she's a, a high school teacher and she has mouth cancer, a very rare form of mouth cancer. So I'm going to be chatting with her later today. She can't even talk right now. And I'm also going to be visiting with my friend H, who is has had two rounds of breast cancer and a brain tumor. So she's going to uh, appointments this morning. And my friend Rox is coming in from Yellowknife. We to interviewed her. Yeah, who Paul and Douglas interviewed uh, a couple months back. So um, it's kind of a big day. And I just wanted to say shout out to teachers. Shout out to people who have uh, struggled with cancer. And... Um, that's all I got. Thanks for letting me in. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank so yeah, that's uh, that was Cassie who sent me that story. So thank you, Cassie, because that's an important story and it's one that we feel necessary to cover. Because how many times have we said this is how they this is how they start to take over, and and these are these are individuals who are motivated by their religious ideologies and nothing else. They don't have political ideologies. They want Canada to be. Well, the, the dominion of Canada, they, they're dominionists. They want to come in and, and create Gilead. It's not a joke. I, I'm, I'm not being hyperbolic. This, this is really what the long-term plan is. And if we are not ever vigilant and paying attention, this is how it starts. It's how it started in the U.S. and it's starting here in Canada in the same manner. They infiltrate, for want of a better term, school boards. They, begin, they, they get elected as trustees and they start to change the curriculum. They start to introduce ideas that, uh, well, that deny science. Say that man lived at the same time as dinosaurs. We, when we know that factually that is absolutely incorrect. Dinosaurs had been dead for millions of years before man showed up. Man and women, woman. So, you know, if it flies in the face of their creationism, they just don't want it taught. Yeah. Uh, so th this is literally the opposite. You know, when they're going around and they're talking about having a government being less involved in your life. Yeah. This is the, the it's right up there. And so, you know, we want small government. Government, we don't want no nanny state. It's like, but we want to be all up in your uterus and we want to decide what books your kids are reading. And Exactly. Like this, and whether the gym teacher is a, especially if she's female, is a, not a little too manly. Well, and, and like, uh, like, or the arts teacher, if he's male, if he's not a little too. Uh, like Reese said, it's, it's, you know, they can, they can pick on the trans kids in gym class much easier. Well, but it's also a way to, oh, you might be one of those gay teachers that we yes, don't want to. There's that to too. Your kids. So they'll, they'll, yeah, so that if it's a, uh, Coach Beast, if you remember Glee, yeah, uh, they that person just won't get hired. Doesn't matter that they're qualified up the yin yang. Oh no, we don't we don't like the appearance of this person, so we're going to play a direct hand. And 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 it's you know they you know, they target. You know, you know who I'm thinking of immediately? Who's that? Joanna Johnson. Oh yeah, yeah, unlearned sixteen. Yeah, it's people like her they want to target with this law. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, you 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 look a you you look a little too uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. So, well, and uh, notice that they go after you. It's just that we don't want you teaching our kids. They go after phys ed and music. Why is that? Who, who often do you find as a teacher in phys ed who might be a little bit on the, uh, you know, a, a woman who teaches gym who might not be very effete or might like the company of women? And who do you get in music class that might be a little bit more flamboyant than somebody else? Or maybe a drama teacher? Or a drama teacher? Yes, so we this know is, the conservatives love them. This is how they pick it apart. So I'm not being I'm not being hyperbolic and I'm not being alarmist. This is this is really what is happening. And it starts grassroots, small town. That's how it starts. Yeah. The next that's, thing you know, we're saying under his eye. Yeah. Or as a kid, uh, Mr. Jim says, phys ed and music are the ones that generally have the hearts and minds of the children. Yes. Kids P and C bio. Uh casually slides in the Taliban outlaws outlaws musics and music and games too. Yes. Yeah. That's true. Yes. Yeah. Um the last subject I have for you today, other than uh, something I've got for the Easter egg, is um in British Columbia. It seems that uh and the fact that there's a provincial election probably has something to do with this, but it seems that uh, the NDP government of British Columbia has decided to pull the plug on its experiment on decriminalizing yes. drugs. Uh, according to, uh, which article do I have here? Uh, CBC it says, uh, British Columbia to recriminalize use of drugs in public spaces. After weeks of troubling stories about problematic street drug use in hospitals, parks, and bus stops, the province of British Columbia announced plans to recriminalize the use of drugs in public places Friday, radically altering a pilot program aimed at addressing the toxic drug crisis. And uh, I uh, forgot to give credit uh, for the story that I'm about to read there, sorry. Uh, I think, yeah, no journalist, it's just a CBC story specifically. No. Uh, credited. In a statement, Premier David Eby insisted that his government is, quote, caring and compassionate but those struggling for those struggling with addiction, but that patients for disorder only go so far. Quote, keeping people safe is our highest priority. We're taking action to make sure police have the tools they need to ensure safe and comfortable communities for everyone as we expand treatment options so people can stay alive and get better. With an election looming, EB's NDP government has been bombarded with a string of headlines about concerns with decriminalization. The pilot project introduced in January 2023 allowed adult drug users in British Columbia to carry up to 2.5 grams of drugs for personal use without facing criminal charges. The program was possible through an exemption granted by Health Canada under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which allowed for open drug use and uh, in some public spaces. And ever since, conservatives have been saying, look, 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 look. And... Yes. In all fairness, um, hey, when I'm at the Ottawa Beaver Lodge, I'm right, right downtown Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have uh, three or four shelters in their neighborhood. We have the mm -hmm. Union Mission, the Salvation Army, the Shepherds of Good Hope. Um, it's impossible not to notice. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things here that they're, they're, Here's where it gets into a complex, convoluted, complicated area, and I am not qualified to make a call on this one. I'm not. And what I'm about to say is something I discussed with Bridget the other day, and she said, I think the concern here now is that they're doing this, that they're going to put it back into the alleyways where it's out of the sight, where people will just die. Yeah. So, again, I don't, I'm, I'm not qualified to make the comment on this, uh, on whether this is a good or bad decision, but I can pose the question... Won't this drive this back into the shadows again? Because people are still going to use. They're still going to use, period. It's an addiction. It's an addiction. So why are we not getting people the help they need to get clean and sober? Yeah. You know, just lifting the laws that, re, you know, decriminalizing the drugs. Okay, but you're, you should have a program to try and get these people off the street and into into a shelter or into a rehab clinic where they can get clean and sober, where they can become members, productive members of society. And, and there's a whole different kettle of fish there in that statement, because now I sound like a complete capitalist, but yeah, people, people don't want to be strung out. They don't. They're, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. No, 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 but let's put this, no, I've seen it because 
I'm, I'm reading articles, I'm getting familiar, and there are lots of people, for example, yes, I understand that I'm on methadone. I'm not mm -hmm. completely clean. Mm -hmm. I'm functional and I'm contributing. And that's a win. That's a win. Yes. Right? Well, and, and so you start from Re, that's what they want. They don't want addicts to live because it's too expensive to save them. It's what it's looking like. That's what it's looking like. Um, according and, to the article. From sorry. Tabby G, this one here, rich people will die alone in homes too. It's just not a poor person issue. And that's exactly. the other thing. That's the other thing. There are people who work uh, in, in different positions in society, and some of them earn great deals of money who are addicted to whatever the drug is and will use in the shadows and can't get the help. And yeah, they will OD. There yeah. are white collar productive producing members of society who are addicted to drugs. Yes. The, the segment of when we hear on the street about people dying in overdose, right? We always hear about the back alleys and the dens and other stuff like that. But uh, there is a significant percentage mm -hmm. drug overdoses that are not poor people. Nope. That are pe people that live in great neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Have a job. And they die alone. And, and oftentimes the family will hide what the cause of death was because they don't want to bring shame upon them. And I, I can understand that, you know, but one of the things that I think how you, how you change, how you change the view of greater society is to start admitting what is happening instead of glossing it over to spare somebody's feelings. Yeah. Look, I know this is a difficult subject, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to broach it for a minute or two. And I've talked to my family about this. And I said, look, if I ever succumb to my disorder and I just can't take it anymore, if that were to happen, please do not lie about how I left this world. Don't lie about it. I want you to tell the truth. I've always tried to live my life as honestly as I can. Tell the truth. If that were to happen, tell the truth. Yep. And we're I don't want to, I don't want to die in a lie. Yep. Just, you know, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't have, you know, and I know it's a difficult subject to talk about. And I know Bridget gets really upset when I talk about it, but it, it's one of these things. Be truthful about it. You know, mm -hmm. just be truthful. That's all. We had, we had the same you, thing. You can help community. other people in the process. Yeah. We had the same thing in the gay community too, back in the day. Again, the HIV AIDS crisis, when a lot of us were dying mm -hmm. um, of cancer, he died of pneumonia. Yes. but not of an AIDS-related illness, though. Exactly. It's embarrassing. We can't talk about that. It's embarrassing to the family. But what the neighbors think. Yeah. Well, who cares? Not everybody in the family knew what would they think if we said the truth. Well, it might save a life or six. Yeah. So, a Vancouver Police uh, Deputy Chief Fiona Wilson testified at a House of Health, House of Commons Health Committee hearing last week about the struggles police are having responding to public complaints involving disturbances related to public drug consumption. Sorry, not last week, earlier. Right. Not last week, the house was on a break. Uh, in a release, the province said it is, quote, working with Health Canada to urgently change the decriminalization policy to stop drug use in public and has requested an amendment to its exemption to exclude all public places. Quote, when police are called to a scene where illegal and dangerous drugs use is taking place, they will have the ability to compel the person to leave the area, seize the drugs when necessary, or arrest the person if required, the province said in a statement. This change would not recriminalize drug possession in a private residence or place where someone is legally sheltering or at an overdose prevention sites and drug checking locations. So it seems that it's not so much a repeal as an adjustment is that you can still possess, but it's public use. Mm -hmm. specifically uh, that would uh, now change. BC Health Minister Adrian Dix said the province is also introducing specific measures aimed at curbing illicit drug use in healthcare facilities, including the prohibition of street drug, drug possession or use. I'm not sure how they're going to do that because nurses are not police officers, but I'm sure they'll yeah. come up with 
the certain way. Quote, we are taking immediate action to make hospitals safer, ensuring policies are consistent and strictly enforced through additional security, public communication, and staff supports, Dix said in a statement. The action plan launching today will improve how patients with addictions are supported while they need hospital care while preventing others from being exposed to the secondhand effects of illicit drug use. Um, now, the article goes on and on here. Um, it says that the decriminalization pilot was introduced in January 2023 um, after um, more than 14,000 people had died since uh, the opioid emergency was declared in 2016, largely due to fentanyl. Mm -hmm. um, well, so this, RC. yes, so this project had a objective of trying to reduce the stigma associated with drug use uh, had the unintended consequence of there being more open drug use in public spaces they're trying to curb the public spaces part of it mm -hmm. um you have um people on the conservative side tried to spin this as bc has completely repealed it and therefore they were right BC has completely repealed it. And Justin, BC has completely repealed it and Prime Minister Drugs Trudeau's drug policy. They will say, haha, we were right all the time, take it away. But it hasn't been completely repealed. So if you hear that, that's a bit of a lie. Uh, the reason they may not have completely repealed it uh, may have something to do uh, with what I'm about to read you. Um, if you were on Twitter, um, you're probably familiar uh, and you know follow politics and whatnot. You're probably familiar with uh, a person named Guy Felicella. Mm -hmm. uh, Guy Felicella is a, a person that had been addicted to drugs for several, several, several years. Um, managed to get clean. He's and a good follow. He, yeah, you know he does education and advocacy work. And that he goes to schools, he talks to kids, uh, he, he stays on top of the file, he does a lot of public education. Um, recently, uh, he had been invited to speak at two different organizations around the same time, and then one found out he agreed to speak at the other one, and I guess two organizations had to beef without each other and got disinvited, which is uh, a really stupid thing to do because, again, if it is the cause that matters, you don't care if a good person is speaking at an event organized by someone you consider to be a rival. You bring him to your event as well. Period. Because it's supposed to be about the content and the cause, not about your personal issue. When you have two organizations that uh, you know invite someone to speak in this, oh well, you invited them. Well then, you know, you can, you're not welcome here. You mm -hmm. kind of the plot. You kind of made the issue more about your personal feelings about another organization and not the cause that you your core mandate. So that's not really cool. But uh, to listen to him speak, he uh, posted something on Twitter um, that came up just before this announcement was made. Uh, he posted this on April 23rd, and I thought it was really interesting because uh, one of the things that we criticize on the show is conservatives say, oh, well, we tried this for 30 seconds. It didn't work. We need to cancel it. Mm -hmm. This is one of these policies. As soon as it was announced, they were asking it to be can canceled. Yeah, before right. we even knew what the results would be. Yeah. Let me read this because this is worth your time. Although it's too early to say anything with confidence, drug poisoning deaths in BC seem to be going down. Mm. The number of deaths in December, January, and February in this province were all lower than the same months in each of the two years prior. And since November, the number of deaths has inched down from 227 to 226 to 200 to 177. In February, March, death numbers will be out soon. Okay, so from 227 to 177. That's 50 fewer deaths. Mm -hmm. 50 fewer deaths. That's more than a 20% reduction in deaths. And how, how long had the policy been in place for? One year. Yeah, one year and uh, one year and four months now. But this is up until uh, uh, February and March numbers aren't even out. So this is January. So the, these numbers are as, as, as at one year, right? Specifically, 
The numbers are posted online. Anyone can look at them anytime. So it surprises me that so many in the public and the media are repeating the conservative narrative that, quote, BC's harm reduction, decriminalization, safe supply experiment is failing when the numbers show no such thing. If things are trending in the right direction, it's hard to pinpoint the exact reason. Are more people getting their drugs tested and or going to overdose prevention sites to use them? Are the small number of safe for supply prescriptions written for the people at most severe risk of death helping them stay alive and get stabilized? Is BC's decriminalization pilot easing fears of drug seizures and criminal charges enough that people are not using alone as often? Mm -hmm. It's early to say. We know from eight years of the crisis how quickly things can shift. In recent weeks, we've seen how media attention has led to increased demand for diverted opioids and that criminal organizations have responded by making counterfeit pills full of deadly fentanyl and benzos. Wouldn't be surprised if that has a detrimental impact. My point, though, is that it's too early to cancel any of the programs or policies that might be helping. We are talking about people's lives. These interventions deserve the time, space, and proper analysis required to see if they work before leaked memos and salacious opinion pieces deal, derail all of the evidence-informed strategies underway. Um, I am going to uh, send you a link to his tweet mm -hmm. because his tweet actually has a table that goes from 2014 to 2024, and it shows every month, mm -hmm. and shows unregulated drug deaths by month for the last 10 years. And I'm looking January, and 2014 it was 23. By the time we got to 2020, it was 79, and then it really picked up during COVID. So 2020 was 79, 2021, 189. 2022, 218, 2023, 229, before dropping down to 200 in 2024. Wow. It more than doubled. It more than, it almost tripled. Well, over COVID, it did triple. That's wild. People using alone and dying alone. Yeah. Lane Staley. Lead singer of Alice in Chains died alone. Heroin yeah. addiction. Yeah. So it could have something to do with the policy. It could have something to do with the end of COVID. Mm -hmm. Could be a combination of both. We don't know yet. It's too but soon to, to number yeah. yeah, it's just one year. But it was a three year. It was supposed to be a three year pilot. The reason these are organized as three-year pilots. It, it, the number wasn't just pull out of thin air. No, no. We research. pay super intelligent people to think about this, and they said this is about how much time as it needs to roll over mm -hmm. <clears throat> to get the program in place, do the work with the community, let them know that's there, let them know that they will be safe, gain the trust. Because like everything, we've learned this during COVID, you have to bend a curve first well something that that i think uh, i'm going to address here for a moment or two if if you'll allow me the leeway it's on topic don't worry i'm not i'm not squirreling yeah. out here <laughs> something that never gets discussed and you will have certain members of a certain political stripe look down upon people who are you know unhoused or living rough who are using substances to try and alleviate their physical and emotional pain that they may be suffering. And sometimes they may resort to criminal activity to get the funds they need to get the medication they require. I'm using medication as a, as an applied term here because when you're suffering, it's medication. Yeah. But what we never talk about is the drug addict with means. We don't discuss the, 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 the wealthy drug addicts and there's a lot of them. One of the things that, that separates somebody in the streets to somebody who dies in, in a fancy hotel room is budget. They were no different. Chris, um, oh, I can't remember his last name right now for some strange reason. But Chris Tucker talked about, Chris Farley. Chris Tucker talked about Chris Farley. He said, you know what the difference between Chris Farley was and that homeless person there? Chris Farley died with $75,000 cash in his pocket. He had an unlimited budget to pursue his demons. 
That guy over there was sold bad drugs that was cut with rat poison, and he ended up dying as a result. He says the only difference is budget between the two. And nobody ever talks about that. I know a lot of people who have money. I know a lot of wealthy people. I know a lot of really wealthy people. And some of them have addictions. Now, they don't see it as a problem because they can afford it. Nobody ever discusses that. And it's, it's a real problem. Pardon? Functioning addicts. Functioning addicts because, you know, they have the means. They're able to keep their job. They're able to keep earning money. In some case, invest in real estate and, and other ventures. But I've, I've seen a lot of these folks, and I feel for them. And uh, oftentimes it's not drugs, it's alcohol that they turn to. But some turn to drugs because they don't like being hungover. Others just start the day with a, with a Caesar because that helps cure the hangover and gets them through the day. And I'm not picking on anyone here, believe me. I feel for anybody who is suffering from an addiction of any type, no matter what it is. It's not an easy way to live. But we never talk about the functioning alcoholics or the functioning drug addicts, and there's a lot of them. A lot of them. But all we ever do is punch down on that homeless guy in the street who's smoking crack in an alley because he's a simple, easy target, right? And the cons are the first ones who will go after that guy or gal. They don't talk about their colleague on the hill who is a raging alcoholic. And I'm not naming names. I'm not. I'm not even, I'm not even insinuating, okay? I need you to understand that. I'm not pointing a finger, and I'm not insinuating, and I'm not naming a name. That is not the case here. But I can guarantee you there's a lot of members of parliament who are raging alcoholics. Yes, or cocaine or amphetamine. Yes. Because the schedule of the job. Exactly. It, it, it's a fact. But that never gets discussed. Somebody says, we should start drug testing these people. And I'm like, no, I don't think we should. I don't think we should. I think that's an invasion of their privacy. And if they are struggling with an addiction, it's none of our damn business, quite frankly, as long as they can do their job and they're functioning. But if we can get them the help that they need to get better, well, we're doing a service. I mean, Senator Patrick Brazo talked about how he was a mess. He was a mess, but he turned his life around. He got clean and sober and is somebody who discusses his mental health openly like I do. And he's a, a person in a position of power and authority where he can help to make change. Me, all I can do is just talk to people and hopefully people listen and can talk to other people so that we can effectively change things from a society level. But I, I'm not able to enact any laws or, or bring in any sort of legislation that would help people. But we can, we can all influence each other positively by talking about our experiences and talking about how there are people who are in positions of power and authority who have addictions who need help. But they never get talked about. They're left behind in the shadows. And that's yeah. a problem too. And I'm not saying won't somebody think of the wealthy. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying won't somebody think of everybody who has an addiction as equally addicted. The full problem. Yeah. Period. Yeah, Shadika saying, I knew substantially more functioning addicts than downtrodden addicts. Yeah. And you know why? Budget. Budget. Yeah. That's what it boils Budget. down to. That's what it boils down to. You don't have the money to get drunk or get high. Oh, well. Man, I, I dated a functioning alcoholic for four and mm -hmm. a half years who never missed a day of work. Yeah. I, I, there's a fellow I used to work with who, and I... Hardest worker I ever met. Same but, thing. There's a guy I used to work with, I'm not going to say his name, but he would drink 24 bottles of beer a night. Every night. And he'd be the first one at work and put in the hardest effort all day long. But when that three o'clock bell rang, he was gone because he was right back to the tavern. Yep. Then one day he just said, that's it, I'm done. And never touched a drink again. That was over 10 years ago. Yep. And I, I went out with him one night for drinks and I'm like, I got to go home. <laughs> and he was still rolling. He was one of those individuals who would, uh, 
you know, you get your three beer glow, you know, that happy sort of joyful. He plateaued and stayed there and he would drink 21 more bottles of beer. And I've seen him do it. He never got drunker. He all, he plateaued after three and stayed there the whole time. Damn. And he could, he, and he could do it. And again, he'd be the first one at 7am. He'd be on job. He'd be on the job site. He'd be there at work his butt off. Knew more than anybody. Worked harder and faster than anybody. But at three o'clock, he had to get to the tavern. Yeah. And like I said, he, he just one day said, okay, that's it. And went cold turkey. Now, I don't know how that must have been a rough couple of days. Yeah. But he did it. He, now, what, and, and he only drank beer. He only drank uh, blue and in the bottle. He didn't drink pints. I'm, I'm not trying to downplay it, but I think the, the withdrawal would be a little less so if you're drinking bottles of beer as opposed to drinking a bottle of whiskey each night. Yep. But I don't know. I'm not an expert in the field. If anybody can tell us, please feel free to, to share in the chat how that is and what that's like, because I have no idea. Hmm. I have no idea. <laughs> Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. Uh, kind of a heavy heavy bunch of topics today but sometimes yep. that's how it rolls you know we we heavy things especially, need to be discussed right yeah, especially for a slow news weekend yeah <laughs> um but yes a little heaviness kids and cubs that's the end of this episode of the daily beaver morning show fourth season uh we hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you remember sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless so please tell your peeps and poops all about us we appreciate that very much. If you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you do not have to. Thanks to the right girl. If you cancel, if you cancel, if you scan that QR code that is uh, right uh, by my chin there, that will take you to our pod page. That's podpagecom slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with hyphen between each one of those words. And uh, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, we'll come directly to you if you subscribe there. If you'd like to help us in other ways, make like Kit Elaine and go to our True North Eager Weaver Media Incorporated YouTube page and click our buttons like, share, subscribe. We have three of them for you. They make us very happy when you do it. So uh, please get us some happy and uh, click on us there. We appreciate it. And if you would like to support us in other ways, the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head brings you to the Emergency Hydration Fund here at the Beaver Lodge at our coffee page. That's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver lowercase letters, all in one word. And there you will find our tip jar. If you drop a couple of coins in there for us, uh, that helps us produce the show and bring it to you. And uh, every cent gets reinvested back into it. So uh, we thank you very much for all your help and your support. It means a lot to us. But of course, as we always say, the gift of your attention is the gift we cherish most. It's very true. Because democracy is something that you do. Uh, please, again, write those letters. Um, and again, uh, you know what Paul is uh, mentioning about uh, school birds and stuff like that. Um, if you're in your town and your municipality and you have some time and uh, you don't want that happening, um, run for something. Run for something, yes people like you and look we're not i need i need you to understand this too and this is important you are allowed to worship whomever you want whatever you want we don't want to take that away from you but we also don't want you to force it upon others because that takes away choice that takes away freedom that is the antithesis of a free democracy a free and fair society. Worship whomever you want. Don't force others to do the same. That's it. And those are the words of wisdom for today, buddy. Wow. That's, that's some actually good stuff. Um, Thank you. From Beaver Lodge, this is your Eagle Beaver saying, it could be a tough world out there, kids, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. <sighs> Mr. Grizzly, cue the cock, and we'll be back with some... You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to 
fill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, kids and cubs, uh, I promised you some good news for the Easter egg. Um, once again, another weekend, another world championship. Thanks again. Cool. Our curlers, um, our mixed doubles team, national team, was at the world championships. Uh, they did make the playoffs. Unfortunately, they lost in the first round of the playoffs to Team Estonia that went on to win the silver medal. Uh, but still, a good performance from Team Canada in mixed doubles. But uh, it is our uh, senior curlers because uh, Canada, uh, for the 10th time in history, has swept the gold medals mm. in both men and women's senior curling. So uh, congratulations. Team Howard Rajala of Ottawa captured its first world championship, downing Scotland's team Graham Connell 7-2, while team Sherry Anderson of Saskatoon made history with the first being coming the first three-time winners as world seniors, earning a gold with an 8-4 triumph over team Jackie Lockhart of Scotland. So uh, both of them were Canada-Scotland uh, finals. And um, Howard Rajala, uh, if you'll remember when we were talking about us hosting the Ontario Senior uh, Men's Curling Championships uh, at our um, curling club, um, Rajala, he was mm. there. So when we told you that we had uh, good people, uh, we have the future world champion. Cool. Play so so. Uh, congratulations uh, to the members of both teams, Canada. Uh, we have uh, Anita Silvernagel, Brenda Gortson, Patty Hersekorn, and Sherry Anderson, and then the national senior coach, Bill Chishart, mm -hmm. along with Bill Daniel, Paul Madden, Chris Fulton, and Rich Moffat, and Howard Rajala. So, um, Congratulations. Thank you for doing this proud. Cool. So I've got, uh, I've got a, uh, a programming note and two quick hits for you. Programming note. I will be doing an ASMR show at 9 p.m. this evening for those of you Good. who are curious and need to chat. Oh, you will need it today. Some people will need it today, uh, myself as well. So that's the first hit. The second hit is, how about them Leafs? Oh, right. Ooh. Yeah. They are one game away from elimination. <laughs> Yeah. It's not looking good. And you know what? Boston just has their defense is too strong, period. They've got a better goaltender and their defense is so strong. That's what it boils down to. And in the playoffs, if you don't have world-class goaltending, you're not getting anywhere. And then for the final hit, I have something for you that you're going to get a kick out of, sir. Ooh. Uh, this was sent to me earlier. And it, I think this was from yesterday, but don't quote me on that. But this is a... Uh, this is funny. Stop the deportations. Listen, we have a worker shortage in Canada. We have a demographic problem. Our population is too old. We need 700 young people. We need 700 young people to work in our factories, in our hospitals, in our shopping centers, driving truck, being accountants, lawyers, doctors. We need these workers in our country. It makes no sense for Canada to send them back when they could stay here and earn powerful paychecks and raise their families in peace. So shame on Justin Trudeau for trying to deport these wonderful students. Stop the deportations. Keep the, the students here. Allow them to apply just like everyone else for permanent residency. The conservatives will continue to fight. Stop the deportations. Okay. <laughs> when was this? Because this is not recent. He's, he's flip-flopped on that. I don't know when it was, but it's like, wow. <laughs> Just, I don't know when it took place. Was he wearing so, his glasses in that video clip? I'm not sure. So, so the, there was a time he was calling for powerful paychecks also for foreign students? Apparently. Really? Hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. <laughs> yeah it's it's all it's just mind-boggling it's mind-boggling well 
uh, since we were talking Stanley Cup playoffs, uh, it's looking bleak for the Leafs and it's looking bleak for the Jets, but it's looking good for the Canucks and the Oilers right now. Yes, it so. is. Yep. So let's right. go, guys. And it's looking good for uh, also uh, Canada's under-18 uh, team, uh, which is also competing at a World Championships and uh, got through the round robin portion doing very well as we head out to, to the playoffs. So more cheering there as well. All right. Get some Cubs. Have a terrific day. I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll be uh, seeing you uh, hopefully at uh, nine p.m. this evening if you want to tune in. Take care. Yeah. Oh, and send some good vibes for the Venom Vipers. <laughs> <laughs>